Uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. So um, I'm sure we all from most of us are from South Africa. So it's definitely good morning. Um, we're doing another web UI, a, a web, a webinar on web UIs, because we feel that maybe we need to just go th through the, you know, the latest version of the product because it's been out for three years, and we're getting more and more people now that are going onto it, and we're getting at least at least ten a month going onto web UIs and and moving off the not off the on-premise, but using it together with the on-premise version. So we thought we'd just give us a, um, give us a refresher course on the installation and also on the features um, that are available in the web UIs and if there's anything that's changed in the newer versions. Okay, so I, I want to repeat, um, I want to actually repeat the uh, SDK development toolkit to just to mention to you that because the products have all been developed in JavaScript and C Sharp and Razor views, this is the latest technology for the web. This has been given to us by Microsoft on the MVC development environment. So our latest versions of the web UIs have been developed in the latest versions of, of JavaScript, et cetera. So they're pretty much on the future perfect in that level. And um, because we've also written the, um, you know, we've written new web UIs and new user interfaces. We've also included all the features that come with the on-premise version into the, into the web UIs, in, including like screen customization, standard export, import, et cetera, as well as screen resizing. The screen resizing, of um, which is where it resizes the screen fonts, has come now with the latest 2022, 23 versions. So if your clients are on 2020, it's definitely worth looking at the later versions of, of the web UIs because they have added quite a few extra features. Basically, the view architecture in the background is, is the solid C views written many, many years ago and have just been changed and debugged in the last 20 years, which is a good thing because obviously that comes forward with, with a nice, a strong development environment wrapping the actual data in a very nice pattern. So let's go now to the actual... Obviously, we're going to go just quickly through the way the web UIs work as opposed to on-premise. Okay, again, the views are, on, are from the on-premise version and they sit on the server, okay? Um, the data is wrapped or protected by these views. Um, and over the view uh, over the years, these views have been cleaned up and debugged. So there's no, um, there's no new, um, uh, how would you put it? No new way, no new worries of is the data gonna go to the database correctly or not? So if there are any issues normally we have in the web UIs, it's on the actual UI itself and not in the background going to the, to the database. Okay, these views sit on the server. So therefore the overhead is minimal on the server itself and will run very efficiently. And of course they're using less memory. Okay, we don't have the whole, you know, the client logging in onto the actual server anymore using Citrix or whatever they use. Okay, and because we can do this is because we have used a three-tier architecture right from the beginning. Okay, and the web UI is very easy to install, very easy. In fact, this little uh, presentation we're doing now will probably show you how to install them in four or five slides. Um, they're not the same as the on-premise version, which had to register all the OCXs, etc. These are straightforward JavaScripts and and MVC um, Razor views, etc., which run pretty simply and very cleanly in the browser. The beauty of this web UI install is you only install it once on the, at the server and there's no workstation set up either. So the, the, um, the maintenance or the overhead or the time to install in a new site is minimal. Okay, and again, you can use any browser from any computer, laptop, smartphone, iPad, etc., and log into Sage 300 via your browser. Therefore, it's definitely a perfect fit for the future, as we would put it. The idea is definitely a good architectural um, creation. It's amazing how we did this in 1996, and it fitted perfectly today in 2022. Quite an incredible time of, 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 of um, that, that has gone past. Okay, um, currently, we uh, every time uh, Sage release a new version, we obviously release a new version of the web UIs. We are currently compatible with 21, 22, and 23. And, and we haven't put it in yet and still 2020 as well. But we really only gonna be supporting the latest versions of the web UIs because every time they release, we have to recompile, rechange certain things in our web UIs to be compatible with their versions. So we want to keep up, keep current as much as possible. Okay. Um, 
the, the, these cloud products do not replace the on-premise version because we have one or two views, uh, UIs that are still on the on-premise that are used, for example, uh, the, for example, the license activation program. They're still on the on-premise. Um, will they ever replace on-premise? Um, well, I doubt it. We've got 3,000 clients uh, who are on-premise and only 300 have gone onto the web UIs. So we don't see us, um, Sage, replacing on-premise completely yet with web UIs. Sage are going ahead with a more development for the web UIs and are currently now doing the payroll and a few other products, PJC, et cetera. So the, the, the web UI future is looking very good indeed. Okay, um, just make sure your web browsers, et cetera, are up to date with the latest versions as well because obviously web browsers come with their own issues and we'd like to make sure that we, if we have an issue, before we even look at the issue that we're having, we want to make sure that your web browsers are also compatible or up to date with the latest versions of the of the cloud. Okay, and they have their own license, the web UIs, um, and there's obviously so your software assurance must be current and they will expire as in the same manner as the software assurance that you have um, for your on-premise versions. So keep your clients up to date with them with software assurance. We are looking, by the way, just to keep you informed, at bringing in older versions with the new features and, in, and supporting older versions of, of say, 300. We're still discussing how far back we'd like to go because we'd like people to update their software assurance for different versions like 20, uh, 2018, 2019, because when we release our new features, we'd like them to also have them. And some clients aren't upgrading their SAGE 300 as quickly as they should. And therefore we might want to support those versions as well in the future. We'd, um, we'd maybe create a poll there, I think. Is it a good idea for Perisoft to start recompiling older versions to be compatible with older versions and not only support the last three versions? That would be a good, a good poll to make and maybe we'd like to ask our um, dealers and see what they think on that idea. Okay, and, and just to tell you where to find the files, some people don't know where to go to find the files. If you go to your product downloads, um, which is off the, um, of the products, well, I, do, I'm, <laughs> I don't remember which menu now, I think it's off the orders menu. I think, yeah, I think it's off the orders menu and you go there to product downloads and you have to click on the bottom right to get the web and then once you get the web, you can let me just point it out to you over here. It then lets you download the web UIs. These are just the names of the files that are downloaded. On premises, 18, 19, or 20,000. And then 18, 700, 19, 700, and 20, 700. Okay. Just when you install these programs, normally I would recommend that you right click or log in as administrator and then install the products. Okay, just before I go into the actual installation, do you have any comments, any 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 feedback, anything you want to know before we move on? Because I'll go straight into the install itself. Very simple, very basic. Okay. I'm not going to wait. Anything? No, nothing. Any comments, Wayne, Carita, that you want to add to what I've said? No, not at this point. No, not yet. No, not yet. Okay. Well, okay. When you run the install, it gives you a very simple selection menu. It will show you the version that's actually what you're installing. It will also show you, show you say, 200's version. Okay. You run the install. Okay. It installs the web UIs. And it, you can also run the Rec Express install from the same. So once it's installed the cache book, it will then, it doesn't unload. You can then click on Rec Express and run the install for Rec Express as well. I'm not going to run it for you. It's very simple, very basic, and it, it, it's a very simple install, very quick install as well. Okay, you can, if you want to, if you've installed your products and you didn't want to install Recx and you want to uninstall, they all will be available under the apps and features where you can uninstall the product separately. Please note that um, you don't need to do this when you install a new version of the Web UIs, as the Web UI itself will uninstall the older versions for you. Okay. This is not the same with on-premise. On-premise leaves the older versions there. Am I right, Wayne? Yeah, that's right. Every time you run this web install, it'll remove the current version completely and then put the new one in. Okay, would it also remove, for example, we installed in 2023 here, would it remove 2022? It will, yeah. When, you, when we do the upgrade, we remove the old version totally. Totally, okay, cool. 
Okay. You shouldn't want to run 2022 when you've got 23 version. It won't work because Sage would have changed a whole bunch of stuff in their own and, and you can't run 22 with 23. In fact, you can't run 23, a 22 PU1 with 20, a 22 PU2 uh, web UIs because they even do changes. Often they do changes to upgrade the, the, the JavaScript. So you do want to uh, make sure that you've installed the latest versions because they often update their JavaScript, et cetera. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I can I can just add there, Bob Sage. For every mm -hmm. PU, not only updating the JavaScript, they're also making changes to all their core files, which our modules mm -hmm. use, and that's why we need to recompile and make sure we're compatible with only with the current version, the current PU. Right. Okay. Cool. And that's why when they're going to release a new version now of a, a new PU in the middle of December, we will not be going to we will not be releasing a new PU at the same time. So I wouldn't install it until next year. In January, we will then, when we can come back from leave. I can't believe they're doing that, in fact. I mean, it's in the middle of December. We all want to go and have a, a break, and now they release a new version of the PU. So don't install that. Wait for us. Okay. Any comments, any complaints? Please don't hesitate to interrupt us. Okay. Once you've installed everything, okay, this is the case every time you do a new install or a PU even. You will restart IS, okay? Obviously, make sure everyone's logged out. And you have to, when you install a new version only, you want to rerun the portal. This is only when you install a new version, complete version, not a PU. So you can run PU. Um, if you're installing 2023 and you've had 22 installed, you do want to run the, the, the portal. I'm not going to explain how the portal works because that obviously comes with SAGE 300 and you should know that already. Okay. They also have one more service which you have to restart, which I think is important, especially when you do a PU. Okay, when you run the portal, it restarts this, this Windows service automatically. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, no, you're right. As soon as you run that portals, uh, portal from database setup, it will automatically restart this. Okay, cool. And 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 therefore this this process is the pro the the service is actually used on the server only. Uh, it will run um, um, the actual processes like posting, uh, batch creation, or database, anything that's got to do with database. So it, it basically runs the actual views on the server, the CNA Windows service. Do you want to add anything to that? No, no, that's spot on. Um, and it also controls the queuing. Obviously, multiple connections um, make sure that nothing overlaps everything else and controls it all on the server. So nothing for us to yeah. worry about. Okay, cool. Okay. Obviously, after you've actually done the installation, you should be able to then run into uh, run say so you have a login, and you should then see the two icons at the bottom of the screen here, which is the cache book on icon on the left here, and the Rec Express icon as well. I like the new black and uh, new black icons. They look quite um, quite smart. And this is 2023 running here. Please, when you do in, install a new version or even a PU, start a new browser session. Close the browser, do the install, and then open the browser from scratch. Okay. Often people say, oh, I'll run the browser, I'm getting an error. You didn't unlog, you didn't, you didn't close the browser, and therefore you might still be getting errors, etc. Okay. Right. Before I go to the next screen, has anybody got any questions that are listening in? on the installation itself, because we're now going to go into the, we're now going to go, oh, sorry, one more thing. Sorry, I, have, I forgot that we share the log file. If you do get issues, okay, you'll find there's, uh, Sage keeps a log file um, under the web, under online web logs. This is off your program, um, program files directory from Sage 300. And you also have the worker logs. The worker logs is to do with the process. So that doesn't often have many messages in it, but the web logs as well, can give us an idea of what went wrong with your system. Normally, this web log is quite complex, so I wouldn't really read much into it. But if you normally scroll to the bottom of the web log, you'll find the latest messages and, and a date and time to see what it was, you know, when it crashed. If we request that, you can then go there and find it, send it to us, and we can maybe give you more information why your data crashed. The good news, and this is amazing, and I must thank my programmers for this, Karita and Wayne, that um, we've written these web UIs and we very seldom having issues. 
it seems to be pretty solid. You know, and the beauty of, of writing in JavaScript, et cetera, is that if it doesn't work, it doesn't work straight away. There's no loopholes and, and, and subtle differences. It either works or it doesn't work. So we've had some very good feedback, very few issues with the web UI, very few. Do you want to just add anything to that? No, I, I can highlight what you said earlier, Bob, because the views have remained unchanged and the views work the same between on-premise and the web. So the only thing that can really go wrong is the user, the user screen, which doesn't affect the data. Correct, correct. Okay, and if you crash on the web and you suddenly find you're not working on the web and it suddenly stops working, um, often you can do an inspect. In this case, we don't show any errors in this particular inspect here, but if you go to the console as it's done here, you will see it highlights the issue in red, like web UI um, um, file not found or any other issues. This might also happen because of the browser or also because of Sage itself. So when you have a crash, often you can see an issue in there and it will give you a bit more information. So when, when you request a solution from Parasoft, we might ask you to go to the console and have a look and see if there are any errors in the console. This is a very interesting little way of looking at more info as how things work in the background. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I, I want to add that I hope we don't ever have to look in there because it normally would be a mistake that we've made somewhere like um, in the actual user interface, something not defined or something okay. tripping over itself. Yeah, we normally cover that, hey, Wayne? We make sure yeah, when yeah. we go and test, you know, yeah. we look, we always go look in the console for any errors, etc. Okay. Okay, some tips and advice before we get to that. Anybody got any installation questions? Please don't be, just please ask, don't be, don't hassle. How many people are now logged in, uh, Natalie? Uh, we have about 11 or 12, 12, I think. Okay, cool. Yeah. 12, 12 yeah. of the dedicated people. I like that. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I've, we've, we've been through most of this before. So if you have installed web UIs, you've probably been through this and you'll find the installation incredibly simple. Incredibly simple. It's just a matter of getting it up and running and, and getting in there and doing it. Um, but really, the installation is very simple to do. Okay, just some, some stuff that you must remember when you're entering data on the web. Don't make large batches, you know. This is really nothing to do with the web either. This is to do in general. Don't create large batches if you can avoid to, because when it posts the batches, it obviously locks the resources. Now, 2023 allows the batch to be posted and then it then releases the resources. And then as soon as you post the next batch, it then locks the resources again. This is a new feature in 2023, so it makes it easier for the, the user to to go and enter data on other on other platform, you know, other programs, um, and doesn't lock the the user and say waiting to obtain access. So 2023 is a, a much more efficient with posting batches, but don't create large batches. Often people import huge batches and then say, why is that locking the database? Well, you've imported 20,000 entries. It takes ten, five minutes to post. Also, when you're entering details and you're entering like 30, 40 lines of detail, remember they're in memory. So if your browser stops working or you lose or you disconnect, you could lose those 20, 30 details. So save after every few details. Tell your client save after five, save after 10, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that will make sure you don't lose your data, okay? Make sure also that the client logs out properly from the browser, from the UI. They must close the UI so it unlocks the resources. And then obviously they must log out and not just close the browser, okay? So therefore log out correctly from the company, don't just close the browser. And also when the client wants to go and get a cup of coffee or they want to do something else, tell them not to leave it in, in the program because the program will automatically log them out after a few minutes or 10 minutes or so. And when it logs them out, it doesn't ask you to save the data, it just logs you out. I find that a bit dangerous. So remember, tell the client log out when you go to have coffee or go for lunch, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's basically the installation and how to enter data. Okay, now we're going to go through the different actual screens and what's different in the actual web UIs as opposed to what's on premise. So who wants to explain this? Wayne, Carita? Uh, okay, I'll go for Wayne. it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, there's actually very, uh, as you mentioned, Bob, we've we've kept the same sequence of all the controls. We've kept the web screens as close as possible to the on-premise screens. And there are still a couple of subtle changes of things we had to do different in the web that because we couldn't technically do them the same as on-premise. So one thing that Sage provides in the web, which is a, a pro and advantage over the on-premise, is they provide what's called a bread breadcrumb menu. It's on the top left there in the green rectangle. And uh, it just helps your navigation around uh, whichever screens you're in. That's one difference from on-premise. Um, okay, we can go, you can see the grid looks the same, but we'll go into the next slide. It'll um, get to the yeah, next slide. Recently, used, on the right side, recently it, used Windows. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go for it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, so you can, if, without having to go back to the main menu, you can just, or these could also be open, and you can just choose, um, you know, from here, reconcile cash book or GL accounts, and go straight from your recently used Windows. Which is yes, very, and you can very see useful. And quick. AR, you got, yeah, you got AR, you got GL, et cetera, on the recently used. So it's a much quicker way of going to the common common used functions in the, in the product. Okay. Okay. I'll just tell this quickly, Wayne and Karita. I'll yeah. just say it. We had to, obviously, we couldn't use the right click in the recon grid. So we had to go another way. So what we do is we let you click on what they call a hamburger. Okay. I don't know who thought up these names, breadcrumbs and hamburgers, but, um, Anyway, there's the hamburger. You click on the hamburger and it drops down your, your choices. Can anybody inform me? Maybe Natalie, you're, it's more your generation that created these names. It looks like a hamburger. <laughs> See, there you go. It's obvious. <laughs> it's literally it. It looks like a hamburger. And, and, the breadcrumbs uh, make sense bread to me. You know, you're leaving breadcrumbs behind. It's yeah, you're leaving a trail to where you are. Fast and efficient navigation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Okay, well, there are your breadcrumbs and there's your hamburger. Okay, you eat your hamburger and you leave the breadcrumbs behind. Okay, cool. I can handle that. Okay, so there from the right click will give you the actual uh, menu that you're used to seeing in the, in the bank recon. Okay, pencil. Come on, Karita, all right? Okay, that, that's right, just so you're, the... Okay, go, Karita. You go, Wayne. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you want to drill down to the details, you'll use a pencil because we don't use the double click anymore, like on premise. That's not okay. a, a web feature. So wherever you see a pencil, and this is only in one place, you see pencils all over the place. As soon as you click on the pencil, it will open up another UI and obviously allow you to edit or change the information you're going to see. So we've got a, quite a few pencil um, fields in, in the Rec Express itself. So in the grid, if you would click on the pencil, for example, in categories, it will actually open up the category in the rule and show you exactly what created that particular um, that particular rule. So it's often very useful to click on that pencil. Okay. Okay, and uh, I did mention this earlier that the finder now allows you to scroll backwards and forwards. If you look at the bottom there, you can see it's got no more stuff to scroll towards forward here, but it does allow you to scroll backward. This is only in 2022 and 23. So if your client is on 21 or 20, it's worth going to this version just for the finder because it lets you scroll both ways. And, and 2020, 2021 only allow you to scroll forward. Okay, this is a great feature. Great, it, it's, it's getting closer and closer now to the actual on-premise version of scrolling through grids. They haven't done the grid yet. They still need to, although you can scroll back and forth from the grid, it only shows at the moment currently 10 records, where of course on-premise can show more than just 10 records. Um, yeah, you can talk about the buttons there. Wayne, you can do it, you add the yeah, buttons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, that, uh, this was something that we did ahead of Sage to keep it looking the same as on-premise. We started off our first version already with scroll buttons working exactly the same, scroll through the batches um, as on-premise. And I think in 2022 now, Sage is also starting to add them to their screen. So just another way of making the web UIs and the on-premise user interfaces more similar. And friendlier. And friendlier, yeah. Cool. And we, oh yeah, so you can scroll back and forth, left and right, etc., and it's exactly the same way of scrolling in on on-premise versions. Okay. This is probably the biggest uh, change. Um, I'll just quickly, just briefly go it myself. 
And the biggest change in the on the web UIs is you can't export um, CSV, et cetera. You have to export in XLS X, which is the latest, um, obviously, you know, the latest Excel format. And obviously, it will then download any file that you export directly into your default downloads directory. This, again, is controlled by the browser and not by us or by say 300 on the web. Okay. And that's, Karita, you can talk about EFT quickly. Yes, so EFT on the web, you can't set your export path. That will also be your default download browser. Yeah, controlled so by the web. That, so, yeah. Yes. yes. It will so pop up and people... say, you yeah, know, but... where, you, you know, like if you download any file, it'll pop up and you'll be able to open it in the location it shows. So we therefore recommend once you've done the download, for the client to either use that EFT file from the downloads directory, but remove it when they're finished, because it's lying around in the downloads directory. Maybe move it to a different folder, etc. But that you've got to be aware. I think we had one or two people that couldn't find the download file, and we told them you have to go into that particular download directory. We have tried to change it. We can't. We've tried different methods and whatever, but it goes straight to the download folder. And with the new version, you can upload it to your FTP or SFTP anywhere. Yeah, the new version is incredible. It's, 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 it allows you then to go straight to the, to the, to the bank, to the bank folder on the bank, on their, on their, uh, my right, onto their server. Yes, or to your FTP or SFTP if you want it. Uh, yeah, actually only to the client's and, yeah. FTP server, and then the bank will pick it up from there. But it, it also will remove it from that common download folder that we were just talking about. If you set it up for automatic um, delivery, then we'll put it there and take it to the SFTP and delete it from wherever it was lying around. So it's the whole process is a lot safer. Correct. And and this is a new feature that the, that the banks are offering, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And you can encrypt it. Okay. So for, we've only got Nedbank doing it with us at the moment. We are going to get hold of all the other banks and see if they all offer the same service. What we're finding with the bank feeds is that the bank feed is not so common um, as one would think. And uh, every bank has a different way of doing it and they're struggling to understand how to do it. So we are going to show you at the end of this demo what the bank's doing with Rec Express and the bank feed. And I think it's the best way to go in the future because if the bank offers that, then there's no user logging in to worry about logging in, et cetera going to be automated. Just quickly, um, in like in Rec Express, we've got multiple grids. So what we've done there is we allow the grid to disappear, uh, to shrink or to minimize. So you can see on the screen exactly what you want for that particular grid or grids by clicking on the down or up arrows over there, as you can see on the left hand side here. Okay. When you hide a grid, for example, cash book transactions grid, we then won't load that grid information and therefore it will speed up the top grids if necessary. Okay, so when you're in no match, you might want to hide the grids and therefore just work in the, in the, in the grid you want to work in because it will speed up the operation and not download any information onto your browser. Okay, just, just one last screen we, should, we threw in on purpose and that is to show you the similarities between the two uh, programs. And you can see that there's no user learning curve here. The fields are in the same place, same direction, same sequence, exactly as it is on on-premise. So that so there's a seamless transition from on-premise to web UIs. We had um, one of the dealers in the last session um, saying that they were because they had to go to web UIs due to the to the the, 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 the pandemic, etc., or work from home, they all work from home using web UIs. They didn't have to use a VPN or a, or a, a remote desktop, and they found it incredibly efficient and much easier to work in. So when they went back to the office and they said, come, we'll go back onto on-premise, they said, no, we're quite happy to work on the web UIs in the future. We're used to it now. We like the interface. It's more modern. It feels better. And it's actually the, the, some of the functions like saving and posting were actually quicker running from the web UIs actually quicker posting was quicker okay so there's certain functions that are so quick that you won't believe how much quicker it's, it's just fantastic i must be honest i don't understand why you're not pushing this harder because the new interface 
is great. And here are the pros. Okay, we just did a quick summary of the pros and, and, and the on-premise pros, okay? So if you look at the web UI pros, okay, multiple different devices, cross-platform, fast and efficient, enhanced search features. We've added a few features where you can search better in RecX grids, et cetera, and in Rec reconciliation grid, okay? We've also done uh, the processes are quicker, posting, et cetera, can be quicker, renumbering can be quicker, okay? On the web UIs because it's got a lower overhead on the server, okay? And we've added the back express to cover up backup so you don't have to go to the server to do a backup or run a remote SQL server backup, um, which is normally restricted by user. You can do it from within the system automatically. And it's very useful when you're doing processing and having to keep a backup and it keeps it keeps a great log file, audit trail, and shows you which batch went to which backup. Okay. All the functionality on premise, every single thing is identical on the web. So we've left out no features. Everything is available on the web, okay? And therefore, because the web looks the same as the on-premise, 99% of the fields are in the right places, same places. There's no new um, new training re that's required. Just to quickly give you on-premise pros, okay, familiarity, obviously, they used to, they've used the on-premise for years, okay? The grids aren't limited to 10 lines or 10 rows. That is also quite a nice feature, which we will be bringing in eventually to the grid. We just need to make sure that the grid that they're giving us is as efficient as what we already have. Okay. You can have many more windows open on the on-premise where you're only limited to 10 on the web UIs, but already, you know, you don't want too many windows open. You know, the client can, can sometimes get a bit lost in that. So that's a good thing. And of course, the export only allows and, and import only allows XLS where on the on-premise you were able to use CSV, OFX, et cetera. But remember, with Rec Express, we don't use any of these formats. We use the standard way we used to do it. So the on-premise and the web UI import for the for the Rec Express is the same. That is no, there's no difference between those those formats. Okay, just last thing I want to quickly just give you an idea. You know, people talk about cloud computing, and they want to put the program on the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing about the cloud, we find people with the cloud, they're finding that the cloud computing is a bit more, uh, a bit more, uh, how would you put it? Um, the, the data is not visible to them. They don't know who's keeping it. They don't know where it is. Although they think it's secure, it's meant to be they're relying on somebody else keeping it secure. So what we've done with ourselves is we went on to, you know, so this is also because of load shedding. We went to a server farm. We bought, we we uh, we kind of rent a server. It's one hundred and twenty dollars a month, and they give you a full-on computer with a full-on uh, with with everything available. We then stuck on the uh, three hundred on that server, and everybody could then log on straight away. And the speed of that of access to those servers was instant anyway because of the new fiber. And we found that um, it's even more efficient. We never have to worry about load shedding about UPSs, about of data backup, etc., because the server was somewhere else and it was being looked after for by us. And um, this is one of the easiest ways of creating a private cloud for your client. So simple, so straightforward. You can back up the data to OneDrive or Dropbox, which you can then have linked to your local computer and keep a backup locally. In general, we found this is very, very efficient. And we've been doing this now for a few, four or five years now. And, and we're finding that why even have a server at all when you can do this. Okay, right, that, that's the end of our great training session. You can see that the training session is very simple. It wasn't much to explain, not difficult to install. Everybody should be on their web UIs by now. Everything's stable, everybody's happy with it. We're getting more and more feedback of positive feedback. Um, people are finding they're getting exact results they want now from their cloud computer, cloud computing. Um, there's no downloading of any extra files or whatever to, to, to run the program. It, because it's been written in the correct languages, it loads instantly like any website. You don't have to download OCXs and all kinds of other stuff to make it work. There's no apps required. It's straightforward, log in and work. Something that we really are enjoying using. And that is why 300 future looks incredibly strong and very very stable i change something that works don't change perfection you can hear i'm very into these web web uis
we use them all the time only. Okay. That's the end of our training, if you want to call it training. It really is fairly simple. So we'd love any questions, um, et cetera. Um, anybody got any questions? Yeah, uh, we have we have uh, Peter. EFT Express does not show up during installation process. Only Rec Express and Cashbook shows. How does EF EFT Express install? Okay, well, EFT installs automatically automatically with Cashbook. And then you would just activate it on premise, unless it's okay. an upgrade. So what, you, yeah. so what you're saying basically is when you install the web UIs um, for Cashbook, EFT is built into Cashbook because obviously it's got to be available for batch entry, etc. So there's no, it, it sits in the background until as soon as you activate it using the activation program on the um, within administrative services, it will pop up and appear in the menus. It obviously has its own license file, so you can also um, create a license file in the, in the, in the demo or, a, 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 you know, etc. So you don't have to install EFT Express. Well, Peter says thank you. I think I want to ask a question, and, and we've had um, Ian Goldsmith has, has, um, has asked us about the, the um, web API, and we, they want to write, um, you know, you can't use macros. We didn't mention this, okay. You aren't able to use a macro in the web UIs. So um, Ian wanted to use um, the web UIs um, API to create macros. Um, but Sage, I've only done the macros, I mean the web UIs API for their own products. And we've got um, Ian trying to hassle them to get Sage to actually do it for the third party products. And I think we need more people to hassle Sage to get that done. They don't seem to be getting there and so therefore we need to give them a few you know to poke them a bit and to get them to do something with that so if, if you guys can also help us there as well maybe make it a big suggestion because the only other way to interface with 300 on the web is to develop like we've developed which can be a bit more complicated but it's not that bad to do once you know how to work java etc okay Anything else? It's quiet. <laughs> That's, I know that people, that, you see the thing about why there are no questions, I think because the people that are on this on the session are experienced and have been doing this for years. You know, we, we pretty much know what we're doing by now. I don't think, I, I think we are the most educated dealers in the world with this product. You know, once you've got a product that has been running for 40 years, 35 to 40 years, you've done at least 20 years yourself, 25 years. You know the product, you know what you're dealing with. I mean, we just don't get issues like, I don't know, with new product. Our products work. We know if there's a problem, we can get a hold of cash, but a pair of software, fix it within a day or so. Um, we, you know, it's just, it's just a much more stable and more efficient product. And I am obviously got a lot of bias towards 300 because it's what we do. But, you know, we've been asked to write for, Intact, we've been asked to, you know, to write for other products as well, X3. They just don't have the same SDK facility. They just don't have the capabilities to write within the product like we do here. It's just so much more efficient. So 300 is a very stable, well-known, efficient product. Um, I think we can all agree to that. And that's why it's still here. Many products have disappeared, yet yeah, we still are 40 years later. In fact, the market's actually growing at the moment. It grows by five to ten new installs a month, which is not we're not talking about America now. We're only talking about outside the US. I believe that the people that had a TPAC uh, session a few about a few months ago in uh, Canada, and the feedback there was that their market has actually been growing quite well, quite strong because the people that use 300 don't want to change. I change something that works perfectly, especially with ISVs developing products that are built into the product itself. What they are also gonna be doing is more and more web UIs will be coming out. And eventually in the next five, 10 years, we should have a much more stable environment, a much more, a, a many more ISVs available with web UIs. So I just see this as a very strong and growth, still gonna be strong. Sure, we can have other products coming along and sure we can have people changing their products. But 
we get new sites more often than we get people changing. Let's put it that way. So the market's still growing. Great. Okay, that's the end of our presentation. So I think I would love, Wayne, to just give you a quick overview of the future of Rec Express because people have been asking over and over and over. We want a bank feed. We want user to log in to the sites. Yeah. So I'm going to get Wayne to quickly just go through what the new features. So we found that the, the, the best way to do a, a bank feed without having to worry about the user logging into a secure site and doing all the own downloading is to actually do it the way that Wayne's going to show you. And there's two reasons. The first one, like I said, was we don't want the client having to worry about logging into their bank because different banks have different ways of logging in and it gets kind of messy. It, it, it becomes very complicated. And, you know, when you've got over 100 banks working with Rec Express, there's no ways we're going to be able to create 100 bank feeds. It's just going to be impossible. And we don't want to do it the way they've done it now where they're actually dumping the files from the screens and not getting all the fields we want. We, it's pretty specific. So when we spoke to NetBank about this, um, they say they're bringing out a new feature, which is where they have your IP address. And every day they automatically dump the, the, the statement into that particular folder. So the client doesn't even have to go near logging into their, to their own website. They do the dump itself into the folder and then Rec Express will retrieve that automatically into Rec Express. Once it's in a temporary file in Rec Express, when the client wants to do, for example, February's uh, Rec Express, they will then automatically, from the from the uh, temporary file, bring in only February. Okay, so there's a slight in, um, interface there, slight interaction with the data, comes straight into Rec Express for that particular month, and the, the March, obviously, every day there's going to be a file that's going to be in the temporary file. So March will not then come into Rec Express. So you can finish off your year end with Cashbook and Rec Express. And then when you're ready to do March, you then go and do March. Okay, so on that note, quickly, Wayne, do you want to quickly show them it's going to be live? So it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah. Um, and sure. Wayne's going to quickly show you the new feature. So, right, good luck, Wayne. Show hopefully, us your screen. Hopefully no problems. Hopefully no problems. <laughs> okay, great. Right. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do I need? Do you think I should show it on the server where the files are? We can just assume I can show you because well, I've got you obviously show them some... where the folder is. You know, just show them the folder on the server. It's actually quite nice. Okay. Okay. So this is connecting to our our cloud server, which is somewhere in Florida or New York or somewhere. Let's hope that everything is. Just takes a while to load the screen. No problem. So, but what this illustrates is all, all the client would need to do is set up their own SFTP server or FTP server. There's lots of products out there that do it. There's even free products that do it. And then give their bank access to whatever folder they show on their own SFTP server. So the client, like you said, never logs straight directly into the bank, but onto their own machines. And the bank will dump the statements there. Okay. Uh, so I've got a I've got a SFTP server set up on this cloud machine of ours. We have created a directory called um, FTP Secure, and in there I've created a bank statements directory. And in here I would have authorized, say, NetBank to keep. I'm I'm, just, I'm not showing your account, Bob. I'm just showing my sample. Yeah. Uh, we would have set up the bank, in this case NetBank, to just dump uh, our statements in there every day. So at the moment I've got four statements in there waiting on this machine. Then the changes from uh, our side, the first place that changes, it would be in bank accounts. You would, you'll see now in bank accounts, there is a, a new tab called Rec Express. And in here, you will just tell the program where to go fetch your statement. So if you don't do it this way, the old way still um, works and you would keep your uh, location of your file as um, local and you would have to go physically download it, import it the way it always has worked. So I'll just quickly show you I've set up CTAC in SAM Limited to go and fetch the file from um, the server I've just showed you. And uh, what we do is we provide all the the main popular connection methods to connect to your own server, FTP and the three different types of SFTP, which are the most secure. 
Uh, in fact, even FTP is going to be discontinued after version 6 of the .NET library, so people will mainly only use secure um, file transfer protocol. So here I've set it up. You would have to set up a user, a key, passwords, etc. And this would be a, a interaction between the client and their bank exchanging their private stuff, their, their credentials. It's got nothing to do with us. We just give them this window. They enter it all in there, and then they're ready to go. And you would go to Rec Express as per normal. I would go to CTAC, that's a bank I just showed you uh, set up to retrieve from that SFTP server, and I would just say fetch. And there it goes downloading from the uh, cloud server, and there should be four that it downloads. And what it's doing now is it's going to download all four and put them into a temporary file, not into your live recon. And uh, then you can decide how you want to reconcile it, maybe one month at a time, maybe a week at a time reconcile it, uh, post it, and then bring in the next. As it's busy uh, doing that, you can see it's downloaded four files and it's deleted them off this directory here. So it removes them from where they were hanging around, so there's no security problems there. And it's put them into the temporary file. So we're in Rec Express, we're in the temporary file here, but as yet, you can see the Rec Express button is disabled. We're not in a live recon yet, so I've got my four statements there and I might just want to do the first statement and I'll choose so we can we still this is very much a work in progress at the moment we are retrieving into the live recon by year period and or date so I might just want to do September 1st and I might just want to do the first 15 days of September and then I will just retrieve it this would now put it into the live recon and do the whole matching process and there you can see it's now ready to go and you carry on as per normal post to create your batches, etc. And then you would just come back and carry on with it. You did. I mean, I, I could retrieve the whole thing and then it all operates as per normal. Yeah, so basically that fetch that you click there, sorry, Wayne, I know, is yeah. obviously might even automate that. So as soon as the, the, you load Rec Express, it will just fetch the statement. Well, OK, I can show you file. that. I can show you that quickly, Bob. I didn't want to. If you switch on auto download for the bank, these were two flags I didn't explain. Uh, you can choose to keep the statement, in which case it'll copy it into a directory that you want to keep history of all your actual statements, and you can say auto download. Uh, sorry, that's what we don't want to see. Because no, no, I'm going... no, I understand why, because you've already done it. That's uh, yeah, I'm already done it, and it's work in progress. This. Don't have to worry, that's good enough. No, but I can show you it very quickly there and if I go to Rec Express it will now begin an automatic download without me doing anything I've just opened RecX and it's looking for statements now because I've already just downloaded them two minutes ago it says there's no current statements okay okay the main thing yeah Wayne is that there's no more interaction by the user having to go into the onto the online banking and fetch anything it's absolutely automated and I, I think that is for me as a, as you know, um, as the as the the manager of the company, I don't need people to start logging into my bank and fetching stuff. It, they can make still make mistakes. They can fetch the wrong stuff. They can fetch the new month by mistake, and we're still busy with the old month. I don't want them to be involved on any level. So we want to make this automatic. So we might even take it two steps further, and and that is number one, do the auto fetch. And then also the auto import. Um, so if they want to do the next statement run or whatever for the current next month, they can then quickly select the right fiscal period and it will just bring in the statement without any interaction at all. Without So therefore, there'll never be replication. The bank statement should never go out. It should just be totally automated. And I think that's a, a, a nice way of doing it. I think the best part, again, of the bank feed, I mean, of this way of doing a bank feed, is you don't have to worry about bringing in the wrong month. You see, the problem with a bank feed I found is that you're going in and you're having to retrieve the transactions and you're going to have to remember which month you must retrieve because you don't want to suddenly retrieve March when you're in the middle of February and you've got to do a year in before you start doing a recon. This way, you just do the fiscal period, hit the button, and it retrieves February only for you. It will keep March in the temporary file, waiting for the next month when you're ready for that. Brilliant, Wayne. Yeah, and the, and the last thing I can mention, Bob, was what you wanted, 
where you would download it and put it in a directory of your choice and then we can set it up that the user retrieves it directly from that directory on the network. So not even have to go to SFTP server or outside of the local network. Which is going to be great because then you yourself can create the files at, at, you know, and the manager can. And then the person that's working Recx doesn't even have to worry about what file to import. Correct. And then Which the manager would have total to control to the actual banking side of stuff. Correct. And that means also, yeah, and that also means that the bank that you're working with, you don't have to worry about them having to go to the SFTP site themselves or having that feature or that functionality. So you can do it both ways. Okay. Again, automating the import is really the last step of Rec Express totally controlling your reconciliation. And the last thing, Bob, that's also very nice about this, the way NetBank are doing it, and we think all the banks are going to do it, is that they will once they enable this uh, functionality, they will deliver the customer statements in whatever format they're already subscribing to. So in this case, I was doing uh, NetBank Secure uh, or NetBank CSV, but whatever the client's got, the formats are already written, it will deliver it to the uh, server and it will import. So we don't have to write new formats for, for whichever banks come online with us. Brilliant. Excellent. <laughs> Great. The final step to automation, digital transformation. Here we go, for real, not some buzzword, but actual. Great, any questions, everybody? Anything else? Ah, opinions on our software also would be welcome. Do you like what we're doing? Do you think it's the right direction? It's important, we do all of this for you guys. Great, brilliant, that brings us to the end. It's a, our presentation, it's done great. It was really nice. We'll be doing many more in the new year.